Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. My name is James Jacob Prash, Morial Ministries. Thank you so much for joining us during this extended season of the international corona lockdown, etc. You know, many Christians have many questions about what's happening. They look at what's happening with the pestilence itself from the perspective of uh, epidemiology. They look at the politicization of these events concerning the pestilence that they see reported in the news how much confusion and even conspiracy theory there is on the internet. And of course, they try to relate this and understand this in light of the word of God. Remember, Habakkuk took a stand upon the watchtower. It is a fundamental mistake to look at circumstances and situations and then look at the Bible in light of those situations. This is called conscientiousization, conscientiousization. It is a false hermeneutic. In other words, you begin with your situation, where you are, your own circumstance, and then you go to the word of God to understand the scripture in light of your circumstance. Conscientization. Conscientization is the opposite of what we should do. We should do as Habakkuk did, take our stand upon the watchtower. Rather than looking at the scripture, through the light of our circumstances, we need to look at our circumstances in light of the scripture. The scripture should be our point of commencement in understanding what is happening and what is going to happen, not our circumstances. Do not look at the circumstances first and then try to understand the circumstances via scripture. Begin with scripture first, then it is much easier to understand the circumstances. The scripture needs to be the watchtower. It needs to be our point of commencement. Many sincere Christians get this wrong and they fall into conscientiousization. When people go into conscientiousization, all kinds of things happen with this wrong hermeneutic. Liberal theology, or liberal, I'm sorry, liberation theology, the political reinterpretation and redefinition of the gospel associated with the Marxist-leaning Roman Catholics in South America, like Benino and Sabrino, or Desmond Tutu in South Africa. It reinterprets the Exodus as a political liberation of a nation, and it sees the Exodus, rather than the death and resurrection and promised return of Christ, as the central meaning of Scripture. They look at the Scripture as a book meaning national liberation. Other people have done this in various ways and have gotten it completely, completely wrong conscientiousization. It is always going to mislead you, but sincere believers, born again believers, do it. Very often, what happens is they get into something called proof texting. They have a preconceived view or a preconceived idea, and then they go try to find Bible verses or passages that prove it. Now, when this happens, you'll inevitably find people taking great liberties with the text. Instead of exegesis, instead of the text and context, it is asegetical. They read things into the scriptures not there. It even goes further with people like Rick Warren. If you can't find what you want to find to prove your preconceived point in scripture by exegesis, not only do you go to asegesis, but you forget about the original meaning of the original Greek and Hebrew languages, and you go to a paraphrase. That is why Rick Warren loves the message. It's because it's not really the word of God. You find a paraphrase to say it, or an inclusive Bible. This happens in the purpose-driven agenda. It's actually driven by conscientiousization. They don't begin with scripture, they begin with their circumstances. Sincere believers do this. They do it for many reasons. Sometimes Christians who've gone into serious error have done this. As I pointed out before, Tony Campola has done this. He's a sociologist and he reads the scripture as a sociology book. And this misled him into revising his position on homosexuality and same-sex marriage. Uh, he used the scripture as a sociology book. The late Harold Camping was an engineer by training and education. He had no theological background, 
and he used the scripture or read the scripture as a mathematical book and got into setting dates for the return of Jesus, something we're told not to do. Harold Camping actually did this. People use scripture as a history book, as a sociology book, as a mathematics book, uh, all kinds of books. Now, this is not to say there is not historical content or anthropological content or sociological content or mathematical content. There is mathematical and historical and anthropological and sociological content. But it's not a book of sociology or mathematics or anthropology. The priority belongs, of course, on the original meaning of the original languages. Nehemiah 8.8, 8, as we always point out. Author's intent and things of that nature. However, there are people, and I've read certain commentators, they use the scripture as a textbook of Greek or Hebrew. Hasidic Jews, ultra-Orthodox Jews, have something called cheder, where little boys are taught chemish, a Yiddish term from, from five, chemish, from the Hebrew chemish. They study chemish. They study the five books of the Pentateuch, the Torah, as almost like children's stories. The real study of Judaism becomes the Talmud, what the rabbis say about it, not the basis itself. The basis itself is something you teach little kids. It's what you learn from the rabbis. That's the real deep teaching. And the reason they use chemish is this. It's how they teach little boys and little girls, particularly little boys called yeshiva bookers in Yiddish, yeshiva bookers, how to read Hebrew. I once read a commentator, a New Testament commentator, who was very apt in Greek. He was actually a Greek scholar. That's a good thing except he arrived at ridiculous conclusions. He diagrammed all the sentences in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and he arrived at an absurd conclusion, that <laughs> the restrainer is Satan. Satan was restraining evil, and the reason he arrived at the conclusion that the restrainer was not the Holy Spirit, or it was not the faithful church, or it was not an angel or something that other people say, the reason he arrived at the conclusion it was Satan restraining evil was because grammatically the Greek language structure made perfect sense when he diagrammed all of the verses or sentences. And he arrived at an erroneous conclusion. Now it's very, very beneficial to know Greek and Hebrew, but they're not books of foreign languages or ancient languages. They're not books of mathematics. They're not books of sociology or anthropology or history. All that's in there. But it's not to be read that way. Likewise, I've seen this with creation scientists. There is both good creation science and bad creation science. As we've said before, there's no good Darwinism. Darwinism is all rubbish and nonsense. However, Creation science, there's good creation science and bad creation science. Good creation science requires not only good science, but good theology. Some people have tried to make Genesis 1 to 11 a science book, a science of creation. Now, it has historicity. It is historically and scientifically true, properly interpreted. But it's not a book about the science of the creation. Neither is it a book about the history of the creation. Oh, it has historicity, and it's historically true. But it's not written as a history book. The narrative of Genesis 1 to 11 is written as the theological interpretation of the history. As we've said before, likewise, the Gospels. The Gospels have historicity. They are historically true. But they are not the history of the life and ministry of Jesus. They're not. They are rather the theological interpretation of the life and history of Jesus. John the Apostle tells us if everything Jesus did historically were written down, all the books that existed at that time couldn't contain it. My apologies for reiterating these things. 
I know many of you or most of you have heard me say them before. No conscientization, beginning with some kind of a presupposition and looking at the scriptures in light of our presuppositions, be they historical, anthropological, even prophetic, political, whatever, and then looking at the scriptures in light of our perception, of our academic backgrounds, of our interests, and then going to the scripture in light of those things to try to find answers and meanings is a wrong hermeneutic. We do not begin with our circumstances. We begin with the scriptures. What do the scriptures say about anthropology in John chapter, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 10, the table of nations? What do the scriptures say about the creation and the science of the creation? Not in Genesis, but ironically in the book of Job. Tells us we don't know how he did these things. Tells us that. That these things are mysteries. It's not to say we shouldn't study science. It's not to say we shouldn't take science into account and apologetics when we study the scripture. But it's not a science book. It's not an anthropology book. Historically true, all true, has historicity, but it's not written as a history book. It's written as the theological interpretation of the history. Now, this is more or less true for various books. For instance, the book of Chronicles was written more historically. The book of Kings records the same history from the perspective of biography of the kings. One is more biographical, one is more historical but they're not biographies and they're not history books, even though they are biographically and historically true. Um, that's the way it is. The book of Acts is indeed the history of the apostolic church up to a point, or at least the major part of it. But it's a spiritual and a theological interpretation of it. Everything the apostles did is not in the book of Acts. We know that Thomas, by fairly reliable tradition, went to uh, India, and Matthew went, 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 went to Black Africa, and so forth and so forth. It doesn't tell us everything they did. It tells us the bits that are of theological consequence that God wants to give us the theological interpretation of historically. It gives us only that history that God wants to interpret theologically. We have to understand this. Never begin with circumstances. Never begin with your own situation. Never begin with your own perspective, be it scientific, be it historical, be it anthropological, be it mathematical. All that comes into play. But that's never the point of commencement. The point of commencement must always be the scripture itself. And this includes everything, including and even to a degree, especially, I would say, the return of Jesus, the close of the age, what some people call eschatology. It's important that we begin with Scripture and look at the circumstances in light of Scripture. Do not look at Scripture in light of the circumstances. Do not fall into the trap of conscientiousization. But let's continue looking at this. I hope you're following me. With the present lockdown and these events happening with their economic and political consequences globally, in the United States, in Europe, Britain, the Far East, Australasia, New Zealand, South Africa, all of Africa, India, and of course Israel, everywhere, it's global. It's amazing. Nothing quite like this has ever happened on this scale. There's only been times in history where there were earth controlling events that had global ramifications for everybody on the planet virtually, whether they knew it or not. Um, you can talk about things like every nation in the 1940s was affected by the Second World War. Well, there's a truth in that. But this is the first time where it's not been something directly strategic, directly strategic, although the role of China does have a strategic implication for things like national defense. This is communist China's gift to the world. I, of course, don't blame China or the Chinese people. I blame the Chinese party and government. 
Uh, I hope I'm not going to get myself in trouble by saying that, but I do. Nonetheless, let's continue to look. When you have these kinds of circumstances and Christians want to know what's going on and they pray and they turn to the word of God, they are inadvertently many times trying to see what the Bible says about their circumstances. But they're going about it the diametric opposite way that the scripture tells us. Do not begin with the coronavirus or the latest war in the Middle East or the latest famine or the latest earthquake. Begin with what the scripture says. Begin with the words of Jesus. Let's understand this from the position of looking at the Olivet Discourse. Remember, eschatology comes from the word eschato, meaning last. It could co-equally be interpreted latter. In these last days he's spoken through his son, as I pointed out from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, that's referring to the Pater of the liturgical reading in Judaism, where you go back to Genesis 1.1, on the Shabbat after Simchat Torah in the autumn time, the portion of the week, the Hat Torah and the Torah, the portions. He's spoken to us in many portions and in many ways. That is the Old Covenant, the Old Testament books or scrolls. But in these last days, Eskatos, he's speaking through his son. Eskatos means latter. We've been in the last days since Pentecost. It's former days and latter days. Unfortunately, the Mormons have hijacked this term, and Christians don't like to describe themselves as latter days, so as not to be confused with that cult. But there's a distinction between eschatos and the close of the age. We call it eschatology, but Jesus called it the close of the age, the end of the latter days. We've been in the latter days since Pentecost. The end of the latter days is what we're looking at. And they asked Jesus, what will be the sign of his coming and the close of the age? And we have multiple accounts. Remember, as we've always said, one of our most fundamental maxims in interpreting the word of God. Everything in God's word is important. Everything. If something is in there one time, it's important. But if it's there two times, it's more important. And if it's there three or more times, it's more important still. And if it's found in both testaments, old and new, put an asterisk or a star next to it. That's really important. Well, the Olivet Discourse is like that. And as many parallels in the Old Testament, <clears throat> and the things stated in the Olivet Discourse are reiterated by John, in the book of Revelation, particularly the sealed judgments. So you have four accounts of something that's going to happen. We have Matthew 24 and 25. We have Luke 21 with ancillary passages in Luke 11 and Luke 17 uh, and 12, saying some of the same things being reiterated in chapter 21, and, and then we have Mark 13. So we have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But Luke breaks the Olivet Discourse up into three sections in three different chapters, not positionally related to each other in terms of textual sequence. In other words, Luke's version of the Olivet Discourse, okay, you've got what Jesus said on the Mount of Olives in chapter 21. But you also have him saying some of those same things in chapters 11 and 12 in Luke. Okay. Uh, it's mainly Matthew 24 and 25. But some of those same things that Jesus talks about in Matthew 25, he also says in Matthew chapter 10. And then we have the four horsemen of the apocalypse playing out these predictions of the beginning of birth pangs that will come at the end of the age before the return of Jesus. One, two, three, four. The more it's in there, the more important it is. Matthew has two chapters dealing with it and one chapter dealing with it in part. Luke 21, 
Luke 11 and 12, uh, and a bit in chapter 17, Mark is the most concise, chapter 13. And Mark has Mark in priority. It is almost certainly the gospel according to Peter dictated to Mark. But let's go back now and look at this even more. The more God says something, the more important it is. In other words, not only did Matthew talk about it, he, he wrote about it in two places. Not only did Luke talk about it, Luke talked about these things in three places. John has no Olivet Discourse. John has a miniature apocalypse, as it were, in chapter 16 of John, and multiple punctuations of John's gospel with elements of Jesus speaking about the last days. He has almost verses that punctuate the entire text of John that speak of the return of Christ. As we pointed out before, for instance, a prophecy of the Antichrist in John 5. If another comes in his own name, him you will believe. Well, it's a prophecy about the Antichrist and a prediction about Bar Kokhba, but it is a punctuation. It's, it's, it's there in the text, but it's not a, in a discourse about the overall subject of the close of the age. Instead, the Holy Spirit ordains for John to write the book of Revelation. John does not have a version of the Olivet Discourse. He writes the book of Revelation, which shows the coming fulfillment of the Olivet Discourse. So all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, I'm sorry, all four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all write about this. And they write about it in multiple places. Now, Peter comments on it. John comments on it. James comments on it. Peter, James, and John in their epistles all amplify, illuminate things that Jesus said about the last days or about the close of the age. So does Jude. So does Paul many times. In 1 Timothy and 2 Thessalonians, etc., and Romans, Paul does also. But people who actually heard Jesus say these things, like Peter and Jude and, Jude and James, and of course, 1 John particularly, they all further expand upon it. It is a big, important subject. As much as I agree with so much of what Dr. Michael Heiser says, I fundamentally and respectfully disagree with his downplaying of the importance of eschatology. He calls it his least favorite subject, essentially. However, Jesus warned repeatedly, spoke of it repeatedly, put a lot of emphasis on it. The Holy Spirit inspired the apostles to write about it repeatedly. He inspired the Hebrew prophets to write about it repeatedly. I don't put Dr. Heiser in the same class with Rick Warren, who's a false teacher. Rick Warren essentially says, ignore end time prophecy, it's a diversion. Despite the fact Jesus tells us repeatedly to be alert to watch for these things, Rick Warren essentially says, forget about Jesus Christ, listen to me. Forget about the New Testament, read my purpose-driven lie. That's Rick Warren. But other believers who are so credible theologically elsewhere do not give the return of Christ suitable reference. Dr. Heiser being one of them, and I, and I think much of what he says is good. Well, this goes back to Luther. Luther couldn't understand the book of Revelation, so he basically discounted its canonicity. To this day, Lutheran seminaries only teach it as poemicism as poetic literature to encourage the church. Uh, yes, Jesus will come back someday, but it's not looked at as anything to be studied or understood prophetically as such. This is Luther. Uh, these things are wrong. These men, like Luther and, and Dr. Heiser today, they're right about other things. We're not talking here about fundamental deceivers like, like Rick Warren. We're talking about good people who've been misled. 
We're not just talking about people who've gone off the rails into apostasy, like Tony Campolo over the homosexual thing. Or we're not talking about uh, Rick Warren. And, okay, admittedly, Luther went off the rails in his later years concerning a number of issues. But Luther began right. If anybody ever began right, it was Martin Luther. Like King Joash of the Old Testament, he's a man who began right but ended badly, but he certainly began right. And we cannot ignore how right he was in the beginning of his crusade when he nailed the 95 Thesis to the door of Wittenberg and so forth. He began completely right. Then he got into the anti-Semitism and his position in the Peasants' Revolt and his denial of the canonicity of the portions of the New Testament he disliked or disagreed with, such as the Epistle of James and the book of Revelation. Okay, he went off the rails, but he began right. What I'm saying is good believers can begin right concerning the return of Jesus and end up wrongly. You can't just say, I don't understand it, that's it, it's not important, as Luther did. We cannot say that. The Holy Spirit wants to illuminate the scriptures for us. He wants us to understand it. Remember, Daniel was told to seal these things to the appropriate time. The reason Luther could not understand it primarily was it was not unsealed yet. It had very limited meaning for his time. But it has substantial meaning for our time. Again, I'm going back to Daniel 12 and then the seals in the book of Revelation. Daniel's told, seal these things up. Revelation, they're unsealed. I can understand why Luther didn't understand it. But I don't understand why Luther said, we don't need to understand that it. it's not scriptural or it's not part of the canon. We can't be like Luther. We certainly cannot be like the false teacher, the heretic, basically, Rick Warren. Rick Warren is in bed with the worshipers of other gods, Hinduism, Mormonism, Buddhism. We have to unite with other religions to bring in global peace. This is the Antichrist agenda and is promoted by Rick Warren. And those who promote Rick Warren are co-equally guilty of promoting this terrible heretic. People like John Piper and even some of John, John MacArthur's people. It's terrible. Todd Friel defends Rick Warren. He's defending a, a heretic. This is unfortunate. Again, we have good people who say many good things in other areas. Dr. Michael Heiser, again, a lot of what he says, most of what he writes is, 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 I would rate it very good and some of it excellent. But he doesn't see a need to get, it's his least favorite subject. He doesn't, he's mistaken. And I say that with respect. I do respect the guy. Uh, we can't be like that. And we cannot get into conscientization. It is imperative we begin with the scriptures. Now let's begin looking at the scriptures. Turn with me, please, first of all, to Mark. Mark 13. When you read the various versions of the Olivet Discourse, remember that they include bits that are not in the others. There are things in Luke's versions that are omitted from Matthew. There are things omitted from Matthew that are included in Luke. There are things omitted from Luke that are included in Mark. We need to read them carefully in light of each other. Turn with me, please, to Mark 13. In Mark's version of the Olivet Discourse, we read the following. Same story when Jesus talks about what's going to happen. And as he was going out of the temple, one of the disciples said to him, Teacher, behold what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you not see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be thrown down upon another, shall be left, <clears throat> which will not be torn down. He's making a prediction of the events of 70 AD, or actually he is echoing 
the prophecies of Daniel chapter 9. The Messiah would come and die before the second temple would be destroyed. Now, this has got to go in context. Before this, he talks about in verse 38 of chapter 12, beware of the scribes. Beware of corrupt religious leaders, religious lawyers. He also talks about the triumphal entry and what happened when Jesus came into Jerusalem. These things precede the Olivet Discourse. They precede it. The temple had been defiled. It had been defiled by people who turned it into a business and a racket. As we talked about many times, they were profiteering from the blood of the Lamb. They were into making money on currency exchange. They were into making money on the sale of lambs and even bribes to get a lamb approved without blemish. They had turned the temple into a racket. Remember multiple times, at least seven times, the New Testament tells us the church is the present temple. We have a temple, only it's spiritual. Just as the temple was corrupted by heresy and by financial profiteering at the first coming of Christ and had to be destroyed, the mainstream church will be corrupted by heresy and financial profiteering at the second coming of Christ. The Kenneth Copeland, Joyce Meyer, Benny Hinn money guys, the Miles Monroe money guy, these kinds of things, Creflo Dollar, it's corrupted the same way. And therefore, it must be destroyed. The mainstream church must be destroyed. It is the faithful church that's indestructible, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Denominational Christianity will not stand. It's been too corrupted by the world and by its leaders. It must be destroyed the same as the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD on Tisha B'Av, or as the first temple was destroyed in 721 BC on Tisha B'Av, roughly the 9th of August. The church is the temple. It will have to be destroyed the way the first and second temple were for the same reasons. Now, when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, there was a new temple, the church. Destroy this temple. Jesus spoke of his body as the temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. The church will be raised up. We are his body. We are the temple. We are the naos in Greek the oikos hegios in Greek, we are the heron in Greek. Seven times we're told that. Ephesians, 1 Corinthians, we're the temple. Gates of hell will not prevail against it. But the visible temple must be tanked. These events you see now when churches are not allowed to meet by the pretense or because of the coronavirus, that's only the beginning of it. It's going to be dismantled and destroyed. This may recede for a while, but it will come back. Understand what's happening. We don't begin with the coronavirus and churches being threatened with litigation and court orders and injunctions and the police coming saying you can't meet. We begin with what scripture says. The temple must be destroyed. And it will be raised up again. Now, let's continue in Mark 13. Verse 3, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Harazayatim, Mount of Olives, across the Kidron, Peter and James and John and Andrew were questioning him privately. It was not all the apostles. It was not the disciples as you get the impression, if you just read Matthew's version or Luke's version, it wasn't all of them. It specifies the ones who it was when it says the disciples or some of his disciples. It tells us Peter, James, and John, and interestingly, Andrew. 
Why Andrew? Remember, it was the ministry of John the Baptist in the spirit of Elijah that prepared the way for the first coming of the Lord Jesus. So too, the ministry of Elijah comes into play once again for the return, the second coming of the Lord Jesus. And when we look at John chapter 1, the ministry of John was active, preparing for the coming of Christ. Two disciples were with John, John the Baptist, Yohanan Matbil. One of them was Andrew, Peter's brother. Not the sons of Zebedee, there were other, other siblings. And although the sons of Zebedee are at Bethsaida, this is right from the very beginning, before Peter. Andrew runs from John the Baptist and tells his brother Peter, those who are prepared for the first coming of Christ were prepared by the ministry of Elijah, by John the Baptist for his coming. They know it first. And then he goes and tells Peter, the return of Jesus will be the same. Those who operate under the spirit of Elijah. I'm not saying they're Elijah. I'm just saying the ministry of Elijah will come into play again in the last days in some way. And it is obviously associated with the two witnesses and so forth. That's another subject. I would point you to our book, Harpezo, Harpezo, available through moriel.org and Amazon and so forth. In any event, Andrew sees it first. When we look at John chapter 1, it was Andrew who was with John the Baptist. We are told the following in John chapter 1. John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked upon Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. As the Catholics like to say from the Vulgate, on his day, we told us, mundi, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In the Vulgate, and the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Notice it was because of John ministering in the spirit of Elijah that they automatically followed Jesus. Those who understand the voice of Elijah will automatically follow him again. I'm not saying literally Elijah, but the spirit of Elijah. Let's look at this. Elijah was up against Jezebel, the great harlot. She's a picture of the great harlot in Revelation 17 and 18. Jesus warned the church about Jezebel. The woman Jezebel, we see her in Thyatira and other places like this. Jesus warns the seven churches, you tolerate the woman Jezebel. One of the issues, of course, is feminism and female leadership in the church and men behaving like Ahab and letting the women take over. The secularism of the world and its feminism coming into the church. We see this today of so many women who are teaching dangerous and false things and men allowing them to do it and even submitting to them. We see this with Joyce Meyer. We see this with Jan Markell. We see this with Heidi Baker. We see this with Beth Moore. These are dangerous women. They operate in the spirit of Jezebel, and the men who submit to them and let them get away with it are their Ahabs. They will come into conflict with the ministry and the spirit of Elijah. They covet. They all covet something. They covet Naboth's vineyard, and they compromise with false religion in some way. They compromise with false religion, as Jezebel did with the priests of Baal. You see that these women, they become ecumenical, or they'll bring in hyper-dispensationalists like Randy White, who says the seven churches are seven future Jewish synagogues. Crazy things. They'll bring in false belief, and men will let them get away with it. They must pander to her. They tolerate this woman. What you see happening in the church today is playing out those warnings of Jesus. The harlot church, the ultimate harlot church, the ecumenical church, the interfaith church, the mainstream church, much of it evangelical by name, much of it professing, will be caught up in this and is caught up in it. 
Look how many Christians follow people like Rick Warren. Look how many Christians have led credence to Rick Warren, including John MacArthur's associate, Todd Friel, and, and John MacArthur's people, and, and John Piper. To, 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 to Rick Warren, a man who says we have to unite with Hindus and Buddhists to bring in global peace. Unbelievable. But it's happening. And it's getting worse. And it's getting worse by the day. The ministry of Elijah will come into conflict with these people. And it will result in a schism within the church. There'll be 7,000 who don't bow the knee to Baal. There will be a faithful remnant of the church, the same as there was a faithful remnant and is a faithful remnant of Israel who accept Yeshua as the Messiah. But it's going to happen. Remember, to understand prophecy, we must understand history. If you don't know what did happen, you're never going to know what's going to happen or even what is happening. But let's continue. Andrew immediately knew it because he'd been following John, because he'd been operating <clears throat> somehow in the spirit of Elijah. He'd been part of that. Remember, you had Elijah, but you had the sons of the prophets. You had other people who knew he was right and were under his tutelage or influence. Now, I don't say it's just going to be one Elijah. <clears throat> there are two witnesses, and it would seem to me one must be Elijah, etc. We speak about this in our books. I'm just saying the ministry of Elijah comes back, and they are going to be automatically ready. The disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Soon as they heard the voice of the one who had the spirit of Elijah, who was John. <clears throat> and Jesus turned and beheld them and said, what do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and see, come and you will see. And they came, therefore, and saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Late afternoon, one of the two heard John speak and followed him. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, he found first his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John, Shimon bar Yohanan. You shall be called Cephas. That is simply the Latinization of Kaifa, meaning rock, which, which translated Peter. Um, elsewhere, Peter is called Bar Jonah, the son of Jonah. We explain why in our teaching on Matthew 16. He was in the character of Jonah uh, because he didn't want to go to the Gentiles from Jaffa in Acts 10 the way Jonah didn't want to go to the Gentiles from Jaffa in the book of Jonah. I explained that in other teachings. But here he's called the son of John. There's a reason one place he's called the son of Jonah and one place the son of John. And there's also a reason that Andrew sees the Messiah before Peter does. It's always those who are under the leadership or who are under the tutelage of Elijah who will see what's coming. The spirit of Elijah comes back to the church in some way. Now this relates to Daniel. Those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many. I don't claim there's going to be one person. There'll be at least two witnesses, and the spirit of Elijah will be rather encompassing. Uh, be careful of people who go around and try to say they're Elijah. Jerusalem is loaded with such nuts. They're usually people who are psychiatrically ill. They're, they're usually people who are delusional. And, and, and they say they're Christians and they come to Jerusalem claiming to be Elijah, the Elijah syndrome. I've met them. I've seen them. They're all head cases. Be careful of people who try to say they're Elijah, but beware about what the scripture says. The spirit of Elijah prepared the way for the first coming of Christ. The spirit of Elijah prepares the way for the second coming of Christ in the same way and confronts the woman Jezebel. Let's continue to look. 
That is Matthew's version. And Matthew goes on to tell us the list of things that is going to happen in the last days. Uh, we read a concise version of this in the 13th chapter of Matthew, and he tells them, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, in verse 7, do not be frightened, those things must take place, but the end is not yet. Nation will arise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, there'll be earthquakes in various places, there'll also be famines. These are the mere beginning of birth pangs. Notice earthquakes, notice wars and rumors of wars, the wars, and notice famines. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you to the courts, and you will be flogged in the synagogues, and you'll stand before governors and kings for my namesake as a testimony to them. Notice the gospel comes into conflict, not just with the legal authorities, but with the political system. Belief in Jesus will become a political issue. We are already seeing that pushed by the anti-Christian mainstream media and by liberal politicians. Christians being told you're anti-scientific, you're breaking the law, you're putting your children at risk with the coronavirus. Again, do not interpret the scripture in light of the coronavirus. Interpret the coronavirus in light of the scripture. Persecution becomes the focus. You'll be hated by all on account of my name. By all. Brother will deliver brother to death and a father his child. Children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. And then it comes to the abomination of desolation. Well, let's look at Matthew. When Matthew speaks of the close of the age, there are these details in Mark that are not in Matthew. Let us look at this. It says the same thing. What will be the sign of your coming and the close of the age in verse 3? And Jesus said and said to them, See to it, no one misleads you. The first thing Jesus says of the close of the age is don't be misled. Don't follow false doctrine, false prophecies. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah, and mislead many. You'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See, you're not frightened. These things must take place. But that is not yet the end. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom in various places. There will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are immediately the beginning of birth pangs. Then back to persecution. They will deliver you to tribulation and kill you. And you'll be hated by all nations on account of my name. No place does Jesus say the church will not go through tribulation. In fact, in Matthew 24, it says, after the great tribulation, after the mega thalipsone, verse 29, immediately after, he'll send forth his angels with a great trumpet, that's the last trumpet of 1 Corinthians, or the silver trumpet of Numbers, and gather together his elect. This ridiculous nonsense invented by John Darby and those who influenced him of a pre-tribulation rapture is nonsense. We are not appointed unto orge, wrath. We're saved out of the wrath of God. But you will have tribulation in the world, the rapture and resurrection happen after the great tribulation when we know who the Antichrist is. That's the plain reading of Matthew 24. It's the plain reading of the Olivet Discourse. It's the plain reading of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Remember, John Nelson Darby was a despotic cult leader. Charles Spurgeon, who was not pre-trib, warned against him. Darby 
made himself an enemy of George Mueller, the great Christian humanitarian evangelist to the youth, biggest children's ministry in the history of Britain up to that time. He was the enemy of the people like, like, who followed Dr. Bernardo, who was the same. He was the enemy of the people who followed Hudson Taylor, the missionary to China. Darby was against the other brethren who didn't agree with him. He was against Benjamin Newton. He was against Dr. Samuel Tregalis, the great Greek scholar. He was against all these people. Spurgeon took out full-page ads in the newspaper warning against this cult leader who founded what we call today the Exclusive Brethren. Those who believe in pre-trib following the doctrine of a cult leader. Remember, A.W. Tozer did not believe in pre-trib. Charles Spurgeon did not believe in pre-tribulationism. Corey Ten Boom did not believe in pre-tribulationism, and either did many of the early brethren who knew Darby. The whole thing is absurd. Thalipsis is thalipsis and orge is orge. Tribulation is one thing, wrath is another. We do not experience the wrath of God. Neither is the full seven-year period, the 70th week of Daniel by the lunar calendar. Neither is the entire seven years, the tribulation or the great tribulation. It's the beginning of birth pangs. It's the tribulation. That is the great tribulation. And there is the wrath of God, the day of his wrath, the day of the Lord. No, the faithful church is not here for that. During that period, the primary focus of God goes back to the salvation of Israel and the Jews in desperate circumstances. Don't let these people tell you differently. The early Christians never believed this garbage. We cannot get our doctrine from patristic literature, but the pre-Nicene or the anti-Nicene fathers, the historical writers around the time of Hegesippus and Papias, and above all, Irenaeus, these are people who got their doctrine from the Apostle John via Polycarp. These were people who got their doctrine from the last of the apostles who wrote the book of Revelation. They did not believe in a pre-trib rapture. They firmly believed we would have to know who the Antichrist was before the rapture came, and they got their doctrine from John, who wrote Revelation. Do not believe these people telling you otherwise. Again, many sincere believers have been bamboozled into believing pre-tribulationism, but it is a bamboozling. I thank God the Holy Spirit is showing so many believers it's false. Now the pre-tribulationists have begun to devour themselves. They've gotten more and more erratic, even crazy in certain respects. The traditional pre-tribulational theology was, I wish we'd all been ready. This is still held by people who I respect, such as uh, Dr. Mark Hitchcock. He's pre-tribulation, but I respect him. But then you have the new fangled pre-tribulationism. People who say that, the apostasy, the great falling away, is the rapture. This Thomas Ice stuff, this J.D. Farrag stuff. J.D. Farrag, of course, was promoted by Jan Markell. <clears throat> I don't think she believes it, but she gives platform to those who do. But you can believe what you want, as long as you're a good Ahab and pander to Jezebel. doesn't care. The rapture is the great falling away. That's what these people are teaching even people who want to know better, like, uh, you know, certainly Thomas I, certainly Wayne House. These are not crackpots. These are people who ought to know better. But there we go. You see this being pushed and pushed. Let's look. We're told this in Matthew 24. Then Jesus continues, there's going to be false Christ. Ultimately, I am the Christ, I am the Messiah. Ultimately, it will be the Antichrist and false prophet. Now, the Antichrist and false prophet will also counterfeit the two witnesses of Revelation 11. 
But that's another subject. There'll be Satan's parallel to them. You'll be hearing of wars, rumors of wars. See, you're not frightened. Those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And in various places, there will be famines and earthquakes. We speak about this on our last teaching on the ethnos, ethnos against ethnos, available on Moriel TV. But all of these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. When labor contractions begin, it tells you the baby's coming, is getting closer. But that doesn't mean it's going to be in five minutes or an hour. You have time to get to the maternity ward. Then they'll deliver you to tribulation and kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations on account of my name. That includes the Protestant democracies who used to be Christian. And at that time, many will fall away and deliver one another and hate one another. How you can say the apostasy is the rapture when the scriptures tell us in 1 Timothy 4 and when Jesus tells us directly that it is an apostasy in the church that will divide the church and turn the faithful church <clears throat> into the victims of the unfaithful church. Again, the stage is being set for this. John MacArthur teaches people it'll be possible to take the mark of the beast and still repent and be saved. Oh, I can take the mark of the beast and still be saved? John MacArthur said so. It's those crazy Christians who won't take it. This is MacArthur. This is what he teaches. Forget about what it says in Revelation 14, 11, or Revelation 24. Listen to John MacArthur. Forget about what Jesus said about be alert. Listen to Rick Warren. These false teachers come, and they're all setting the stage for Antichrist. I'm sorry to say that John MacArthur is among them. He is helping set the stage for Antichrist with his dangerous, reckless, and irresponsible teaching that it will be possible to take the mark of the beast and still be saved. Read Revelation 14, 11. Read Revelation 20, verse 4. Among the other errors that John MacArthur has succumbed to. Let's continue. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Boy, is that true now. Mike Bickle, uh, Bill Johnson, uh, the Kansas City false prophets, one after another, predicting things in the name of the Lord that failed to happen. Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, Certainly, Cindy Jacobs, they all can be documented as to have made major time-specific false prophecies that didn't happen. One of the most dangerous false prophets in the church today deceiving the elect is Michael Brown. Ask him about his false prophecies in Jerusalem of a second Pentecost. He won't deny it. He can't. The man is a proven false prophet, predicting major things in the name of the Lord that were time-specific that failed to happen. Michael Brown is a false prophet. If possible, the elect will be deceived. That is what we see happening. It continues. Because of lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. A no man. There's a reason you see people saying, when you point to scripture, oh, you're a Pharisee, you're under the law. <laughs> no, you're lawless. Again, we have other teachings dealing with this. But remember, the Antichrist is the man of lawlessness. All this stuff you see is setting the stage for Antichrist. When you see believers beginning to yell, claiming to be saved Christians, when you oppose their counterfeit revivals or the Bill Johnson Gnosticism and mysticism, oh, you're under the law. Oh, you don't. You're a Pharisee. You're a, you're a legalist. 
These people are lawless. They're getting ready for the man of lawlessness. Let's continue. But the one endures who endures to the end shall be saved. We've been saved. We are being saved. We shall be saved. We've been justified. We are being sanctified. We shall be redeemed. Notice there's a condition. Yes, we have eternal security, but it is not unconditional. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world. For witness to all the nations, then the end will come. The gospel of the kingdom, as John the Baptist preached that in the spirit of Elijah, the kingdom is coming. Using prophecy as an evangelistic vehicle to see unsaved people getting saved. I don't agree with him on his pre-trib and on many other things. But the reason Hal Lindsey's books were so successful and so many people were saved through the late great planet Earth is not because the book was all that good theologically. It wasn't. But he was still using end-time prophecy to present the gospel. It's the gospel of the kingdom. That's what we need to be preaching. We know the future. People are going to horoscopes and fortune tellers, and God knows what else to know the future. We know the future. <clears throat> we know the future. And we should be using what the scriptures say about the future to present the gospel. Unsaved people are beginning to become scared and to question. There's an opportunity. Now, if it's an opportunity, and when Jesus said, preach the gospel of the kingdom, Satan will, of course, raise up his messengers within the church who will say, don't do that. Again, I go to Rick Warren, avoid end time prophecy. He says it's a diversion. That's the voice of Satan. It's not the voice of Rick Warren. It's the voice of Satan. Let's continue. <clears throat> then he speaks to the abomination of desolations, the Shikut Sameshomam about the Antichrist. So we have Mark, Matthew. Let's look at one of Luke's teachings about the return of Christ, that is his version of the Olivet Discourse. Look with me, please, to Luke chapter 21. Verse 6 says, For these things which are <clears throat> you're looking at, that is the physical Herod's temple, the second temple, the days will come in which there will not be one stone left upon another, which will not be torn down. And they questioned him, saying, Teacher, when therefore will these things be? What will be the sign when these things take place? And he said, see to it that no one be misled. Says the same thing. Jesus, what will be the sign of your coming? First words out of his mouth. Don't be misled. Many will come in my name saying, I am he. And the time is at hand. Do not go after them. In the book, The Divine Principle, the Korean cult leader, Sun Young Moon, claimed to be the Lord of the Second Advent. He claimed to be the return of Jesus Christ. After making a financial donation of a couple of million dollars to Liberty University in the United States, Jerry Falwell brings him up on the stage at the student assembly and proclaims this antichrist, a man who says he's the return of Christ. Jerry Falwell calls him an unsung hero. Did you see any of the professors at Liberty? Ed Hinson or any of these believers stand up and say this is wrong? No. They let somebody who proclaimed himself to be the return of Christ, come up to Liberty University, supposedly the premier conservative evangelical university in America. So they've since had false teachers like Steve Furtick at that place. Many will fall away. This man said he was the return of Jesus, and it didn't matter to Jerry Falwell. His money is as good as anybody else's. I'm only stating facts. How can you let somebody who says he's Jesus Christ returned speak to an evangelical university Christian assembly? 
of seminarians and Bible students and call him an unsung hero. That's what happened at Liberty with Jerry Vorwell. That actually happened. And nobody said anything, practically. Jesus continues, and when you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first. But the end does not follow immediately. Don't get rambunction. They're the beginning of birth pangs. Just like in a maternal birth, it's when the water bursts and you can see the baby's head and so forth. It's the bursting of the water that you know is the sign that it's imminent, not the contractions. These things, wars and rumors of wars increasing, are contractions. He continues. Ethnon will rise against Ethnon and Basilea against Basilea, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places, plagues, famines. There will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before these things, they'll lay hands on you and persecute you. Continues. Delivering you to synagogues and prisons bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. Now, the synagogues, synagogue means gathering in Greek. There's a specific emphasis on what's going to happen to Jewish believers and what did happen to them in the first century. But it's not limited to them. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Let us continue. So we have it in Matthew. Now, Luke adds things that Matthew doesn't. Luke speaks of the return of the Jews to Jerusalem. Luke 21, 24. You don't find that in Mark. You don't find that in Matthew. Luke was written to Gentiles who needed to be informed about the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews. Peter was a primordial gospel. Matthew was written to Jews. That doesn't mean its content is not for everybody, but it does mean its primary meaning at the time of its writing had to be understood as a book written to Jewish people. In other words, before Christians, Jew or Gentile, can understand its meaning now, we have to understand author's intent and that it was written for Jewish believers before we can understand what it means for the rest of the church at large in the last days. So you have these things, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, pestilence. Let's begin to break these things down. Again, we're not looking at the coronavirus and its effects or events in the Middle East with Iran and their effects. We look not at Iran and say, what does the scripture say? We look at Daniel 10 and say, what does the scripture say about Iran? We don't look at the scriptures from the perspective of what's happening in Iran. We look at what's happening in Iran from the perspective of scripture, Daniel 10, etc. We pointed these things out. In the secular media, honest commentators, what you can find today being honest, are telling us what the mainstream media and corrupt politicians are really doing. For instance, there are people, and I'm not being political, I'm only stating objective facts. There are people on the left and in the left wing of the Democratic Party of the United States that hate Donald Trump so much and are so hungry to get power again that they are quite willing to see the economic devastation of the lockdown make the economy so terrible, destroy whole industries that it will take years to recover, such as airlines and so forth. They're willing to see whole industries destroyed. Nearly 7 million Americans alone out of work. They're willing to do that because it makes a bad economy and they can pin it on Donald Trump because he's the president. He mishandled this. They'll, they'll do that. They'll actually do that. They're using 
this virus from China for political purposes to destroy freedom. Protests! Oh, public gatherings are dangerous. You can spread the virus. Therefore, the governors of these states like Michigan and so forth are saying, these gatherings are dangerous. They should be illegal. You can't protest me. You might spread the virus. You can't protest what I'm doing with the lockdown. You might spread the virus with a public gathering. And you can't go to church. You might spread the virus. Those who go to church are anti-science. Now notice this lie. People of faith are anti-science. The governor of Illinois said that. Others of these people are saying that. That it's illogical, irrational to meet like this. It spreads the disease. It's anti-science. Somehow faith in Jesus and science are mutually exclusive. Well, let's look at the realities. These same people are pro-abortion. The objective medical science and embryology says these fetuses, late-term abortions particularly, can survive if they were born prematurely or by cesarean section they can survive with improved incubator technology and so forth. They can survive. What's the difference? This is infanticide. You're killing these babies. They could be alive. <clears throat> no, we have the right to abort babies right up until the time they're born. And the governor of Virginia, himself a physician, says that babies who survive abortions should be left to die. This is what happened in Moloch worship. These were the sins that took place in the days of King Manasseh. The judgment of God must come. They tell Christians they're anti-science when they are anti-science. They don't believe in medical science. They don't believe in clinical obstetrics or embryology. These are babies who can survive. You can surgically reconfigure somebody to resemble a member of the opposite sex. Chromosomally, however, as we've said before, you only have double X and XY, male and female. Bruce Jenner is genetically a male and always will be. But he can legally be declared to be a woman because they defy science. They ignore science. They do this with Darwinism. Darwinism is impossible. Information cannot come from a vacuum. You've got genetic coding of the nucleotides. The human genome alone is 13 billion lines of information. Information science says that information cannot come from a vacuum. It cannot evolve on its own. It requires a pre-existing intelligence. Even though there are computer programs that can write other programs, some human intelligence had to write the master program somewhere. Information cannot come from a vacuum if you study computer science. But if you study biology, it can. This is absurd. They are anti-science. With Darwinism, with abortion, with transsexuality, they are all anti-science. And now they're saying Christians are anti-science because of COVID-19. Well, what about Dr. John Ioannidis, the physician and microbiologist, expert in epidemiology? They try to ban his stuff from social media. These two research physicians from California point out that your chances of getting and dying from the coronavirus in California is 0.03%, much smaller than the flu, the influenza. It's unbelievable. You have Dr. Fauci saying that the coronavirus is more infectious than influenza. 
But scientists stated, with the data we presently have, he cannot possibly know that. He cannot conclusively determine that. The World Health Organization, which is a political organ, not a scientific one, supported and affirmed the demonstrably wrong claims of China that the coronavirus cannot spread or will not spread. The World Health Organization said that, then it spread. The World Health Organization said, you don't need to wear masks. Now they're saying you need to wear masks. It's discredited scientifically. It's been too wrong too often. And it is a political organ. But those scientists who are pointing out other facts, like these two in California, that terrible woman who runs Google and YouTube said, we are removing what they said from the internet because it disagrees with the World Health Organization who told us this virus was not a problem because that's what the Chinese told them to say and who said, don't wear masks last week, this week wear a mask. Control of the media and of the new media. Internet was invented at the expense of taxpayers. I've said before, it needs to be declared a public utility and subject to the First Amendment. People like Zuckerberg, people who run Google or Facebook, they don't want that. They want the power to censor. There are people in Silicon Valley and Bill Gates, they're all in league with left-wing political interests. And this will be used against the church. Oh, if you want to meet your anti-science. It gets worse. A $2.2 billion stimulus package to cope with the economic impact of the coronavirus. $600 billion of that alone went to government, not to people, not even to businesses. Six hundred billion alone to the federal government, and then the state governments on top of that. It's funding the bureaucracy. It is not funding the economy at large or the average person. And of course, the political left tried to increase food stamps and all these other social programs attached to it. It is known statistically that long-term unemployment is directly related. to behavioral disorders, mental illness, substance abuse, violent behavior, domestic violence, all these things increase when people are unemployed. What about the impacts of the virus lockdown on public health from the perspective of what it does to the health of the unemployed? Or what about people who are being forced to postpone biopsies, mammograms, sigmoidoscopies, uh, other medical examinations? Cancers can progress. Things that could have been acted upon more quickly, surgically, and otherwise, if properly diagnosed by Biopsy are not being diagnosed as people stay home. Hospitals are not taking these patients at the moment. What about what that's doing to public health? We're not told about that. The idea of the system being overburdened and not being able to cope, the hospitals having no room, that didn't happen. What they predicted didn't happen. Yet anybody who questions this and points it out on the basis of real science, of real epidemiology, is banned from social media and condemned by the mainstream media and denounced by mainly liberal politicians. They are using this as a political weapon to stop dissent and under satanic inspiration to stop the church. 
forsake not the fellowshipping together one with another, we'll make it a public health issue. Now notice, it's not a scientific argument. It becomes a political misuse of science. It's very much what you had in Russia, under the, in the USSR, under the communists. The elitists, the apartheid in Russian, the party membership and bureaucracy. One set of rules for them, the others for the proletariat and the other people who have to be told what to believe and what to do. We know what's best for you. Don't question us. What we do is something else. The day before yesterday, Michelle Obama went on the mainstream media telling people in a so-called public service announcement to stay home except for essential work, essential food shopping, and things of that nature. That very same day at the taxpayer's expense with police escorts and secret service bodyguards, her husband drives 40 miles to an exclusive Virginia country club to play golf. He's allowed to go out. She's telling other people to stay home. That is what Russia was like under the Iron Curtain. The governor of Illinois denouncing people as anti-scientific if they go to church, etc. His own wife gets on an airplane and goes to Florida. When questioned by a reporter, he says, how dare you attack my family? <laughs> Who are you to question us? That is elitism. It's what you see among the word faith money preachers in the church, and it's what you see among crooked politicians. It's what you saw back in the USSR, as the Beatles said. Well, back in the USSR, we should play that on the radio every day, because that's what's happening. In the USSR, the truth was not determined by scientific reality. Science was determined by a political decision. Economics was not determined by economic reality. It was a politically controlled decision. Journalism was not about reporting facts. It was an organ of the state to broadcast propaganda. Journalism was politically determined. Science was politically determined. Economics was politically determined. In Russia, with Pravda in its Vestia, this is what went on. And the party leadership lived one life, the people lived another. That's what's happening now. The lesbian mayor of Chicago has all the barber shops and coffees and hairstylists and beauty salons closed. She had her hair done. When questioned, how come you could have your hair done? What kind of an example is that to the people you're telling they cannot have their hair coffeeed? She got angry and said, I'm the face of Chicago. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. this lesbian mayor. It's unbelievable. It's back in the USSR. One week you can't wear you know, shouldn't wear a face mask, doesn't help. Next week, you have to wear them. First time Chinese said it's not going to spread, the World Health Organization echoes what the Chinese wanted them to say, it's not going to spread, then it spreads. And then if you disagree with the World Health Organization, you're banned from social media by YouTube and Google. It's unbelievable. Well, look what happened to the USSR. They politicized their economy so it collapsed. They politicized their media, it's Vestia and Pravda. So nobody believed it anymore. People would listen to Radio Free Europe or something. And finally, they politicized science. Russia was first in space with Sputnik. Russians have always had excellent scientists and excellent mathematicians. Very good. Very good. 
tremendously good. They were the first in space. Once the space race happened, the Americans surpassed them. Russia's never gone to the moon because the science was politically controlled. You had people going to universities in the USSR for political reasons, not based on pure intellectual capability. Here it's the same thing. They've got quota systems for women, for minorities. It becomes discriminatory against Asians and against white men. Admission to major universities were all left wing. The very policies that took place in Russia are taking place now in the Western world, including the United States. Back in the USSR. Well, that's the situation. But I don't want to look at the scripture in light of the situation. I want to look at the situation in light of scripture. Notice each version focuses on the plight of persecuted Christians. Wars and rumors of wars, the ends are not yet. Let us look at the horsemen of the apocalypse in Revelation 6. The first seal is Antichrist. He comes on a white horse, counterfeiting Jesus in Revelation 19. We talked about this on other teachings. The second seal is war. That's the second horseman, the red one. The white horse, then the red one. Third, famine. He broke the third seal. Come up here, and I saw a black horse. Food shortages. Now look what happens. A fourth seal is death. This is the so-called ashen horse. Death in Hades. And it was given authority over the earth to kill with sword, famine, and pestilence. <laughs> All three. And wild beasts. Now, these wild beasts of the earth have multiple aspects. Obviously, there's a symbolic aspect of the political empires in Daniel. Revelation and Daniel are partners. Secondly, as we've warned, the danger of biogenetic engineering. The scriptures tell about mixing the seed. When they are taking the DNA of one species and placing it into a completely different species, God made them according to their mean, their kind. You can genetically engineer viruses, and there's evidence that the coronavirus is genetically engineered. That's this. Beasts of the earth. Of course, there's been many reports that we've seen on news documentaries how with the destruction of the environment, animals are losing their natural habitat. England is overrun with urban foxes. These can carry rabies and they lose their fear of man. Bears in the United States losing their fear of man. More deer in America now than when the pilgrims landed on the Mayflower. Nobody wants to shoot Bambi because of the greenies. Lyme disease spreads. Shark attacks increasing. Beasts of the earth. Now notice that fourth horseman. It's war, the sword. It's famine and it's pestilence. It's all three happening synergistically. It's not just one, then two, then three. Those are the first horsemen. When you get to the last horseman, they all happen at the same time, plus other things. The synergistic impact. What if food shortages do not come from bad harvests? What if they come from meatpacking plants laying off their workers because of a virus? or ranchers being forced to reduce herds because of a virus. What if it comes as a result of pestilence, not of drought or something of that nature? What if the problem becomes in distribution? Truck drivers, 
railroads, everything on lockdown. What if it becomes engineered famine, like Mengitsu did in Ethiopia? Mengitsu used famine. Joseph Stalin used famine as a military weapon against his own population, and particularly against the Ukrainians. He did it three times. I recall reading the book, The Gulag Archipelago, by Alexander Sosenitsyn. Stalin used engineered famine against his own people, against Soviet citizens, quote-unquote. Will these people begin to use food shortages for political purposes? It's been done. People having to stand in line and get at the supermarkets on the shelves half empty. If the Antichrist comes along on his white horse and says, I can clean this up and put things back the way they were, people will believe him, including much of the so-called church. There's a synergistic impact. Yeah, persecution. You're anti-science. You're endangering public health. You're endangering your children. We'll take them from you because of the virus. Political protests, you can't do that. You might spread the virus. Crooked politicians can say and do what they want by decree. No more democracy. That's already happening. It began with Barack Obama ruling by fiat executive orders doing all kinds of things without any congressional license or mandate, without any legislative basis to these laws. And now they're basically suspending legislative power. Things are being imposed by courts and by corrupt politicians. Thank God when Jesus comes back, the government will be upon his shoulders. We can understand why Daniel shows us that the return of Christ will involve God's judgment on human government that will ultimately come under the control of Antichrist. But now let's look further. Let's understand this spiritually from the point of view of Scripture. Wars and rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, and earthquakes. All of these literal physical events, calamities that are unfolding, that are transpiring, and will continue to do so. Conflict in the Middle East, the coronavirus, the effects of subprime lending of 2008. The world has never been the same since 2008. And you look at the very politicians responsible for subprime lending. Andrew Cuomo, who invented the time bomb, Bill Clinton, who lit the fuse, subprime lending. Chris Dodd in the Senate. Barney Frank in the House. Barack Obama, who when the warning light went up on the dashboard, blocked any effort to prevent the subprime crash in the Senate. Cuomo, Clinton, Obama. Barney Frank, they did it. Dodd, they did it. Who was on Joe Biden's campaign committee? <laughs> Chris Dodd, the one who pushed this in the Senate. It's absurd. Now, again, I'm not speaking politically. George Bush went along with it. Many Republicans did, especially Bush. But when his Treasury Secretary, Hank Paulson, realized what was happening, he tried to stop it. Barack Obama, as a senator, prevented it and caused it. The same people who caused it then tried to manage it to see it doesn't happen again. The Dodd-Frank Amendment. You couldn't imagine this kind of corruption and hypocrisy. But this is what happens when a nation turns away from God. When a nation turns away from God with their abortion, their divorce, their homosexuality, divorce where there's no biblical reason. When a nation does these things and becomes godless, they get godless leaders, irrespective of political party. That's what's really happening. There's a synergy. They will use the pestilence 
the virus pandemic to invoke persecution of the church. They will use it to stop any political opposition if they can. Now, this time, they may not pull it off. It may only be a dry run, but it shows us the way the world is going and what's happening. But that's from the perspective of the world. Let's understand these things from the perspective of God's word. All of these literal, physical events, all of them, are reflections of what is happening spiritually. Let's begin with wars and rumors of wars. Yes, that's happening. Just look at the Middle East. Revelation 12, 7 to 10. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels, waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels waged war. This is in parallel to what happens in the book of Daniel, chapter 10, as we've said many, many times. These physical wars and rumors of wars, particularly those in the Middle East, particularly those involving Israel and Iran, but not only, are a reflection of the war taking place in the heavenlies, of the angelic against the demonic, of what you see in Daniel 10, the principalities, the demonic powers over these nations. War, these literal wars, are a reflection of the spiritual wars of Daniel 10 and Revelation 12, etc. Famine, food shortages caused by Locusts in Africa, caused by distribution problems due to the lockdown in the United States or Britain or Australia. Food shortages, famine. These literal food shortages and famines, particularly those we see in Asia and in Africa. And there are new ones now. There's a new strain of wasp from Japan that has entered the United States that can destroy our own bee population in significant numbers. Bees are necessary in the environment to pollinate other species. They don't just make honey. Bees are vital to the ecosphere and to food production. You have to understand the word for bee in Hebrew is, devo is devora. The girl's name Deborah. Devora is bee. It has the same root as davar, davar, meaning thing or the word of the Lord, dvarim, the book of Deuteronomy. I explain this on other tapes, the relationship between the root of B and the scripture. Remember, the scroll was sweet in the mouth. Bees make honey as sweet as honey. The dvarim make the dvash. Dvarim, Dvash, bees, honey. The word of God in the mouth, Dvarim, the Dvar Adonai, the logos in Greek. The Dvar is sweet as Dvash, and it's made by Dvarim, bees. All these things have a spiritual link to them. What you're seeing happening in the ecosphere, it's all reflecting something spiritual. When we understand what's happening on the earth is because of what's happening in the heavenlies. Let us look. Famine. Amos, chapter 8, verse 11. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for the hearing of the words of the Lord. Oh, there may be a physical famine. But it's a reflection of the real famine for the hearing of the word of the Lord. Don't just look at the bread and the water and the vegetables and whatever. There's a famine for the hearing of the word of the Lord. 
The scriptures are not being expounded in context anymore. Much. You have motivational speaking using Christian terminology. You have false teachers teaching false things. Not just Gnostics like Bill Johnson, but exegetes like John MacArthur. A famine for the hearing of the word of God. And those syncophants of John MacArthur, they know better. It's Chris Rossborough knows better. It's Todd Friel knows better. It's Phil Johnson knows better. But they're loyal to their pope, not to Jesus. Well, what about the pestilences like the coronavirus? Or these locusts in Africa that have reached Pakistan? Look with me to Revelation chapter 9, verse 3, please. And out of the smoke came forth locusts upon the earth. And power was given to them as the power of scorpions of the earth had power. This, of course, relates to the apocalyptic vision of Joel. Well, yeah, these locusts are there. These contagions are there. Viruses, bacteria, prions, these things are there. Pestilences are there. But they are a reflection of what is happening in the heavenlies with the fifth trumpet, this will reach its absolute climax. But already before that, in the sealed judgments, we see pestilences become a big killer. To kill with the sword, famine, and pestilence. Again, the synergy. Locusts devour the crops. Well, what about earthquakes? Look with me, please, to Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. And I looked, and when he broke the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth, made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. The great earthquake. Now, we see earthquake references again in Revelation 16, 18. We'll come back to Revelation 6 in a moment. Look with me, please, to Revelation chapter 16, verse 18. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake, which has not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and so mighty that is the seventh vial judgment. Earthquakes have to do with the resurrection. When Jesus rose, there was an earthquake. Why is there an increase in seismic activity and earthquakes? Well, we've seen the famines and the wars. Now pestilence. Mark my words, we're going to see an even more drastic increase of seismic activity. Major earthquakes are going to come beyond the increases of earthquakes that we've already seen historically. We already have more earthquakes higher on the Richter scale than they've ever been occurring at greater frequency in recorded history. More is coming on top of the pestilence, the famines, and the wars. This climaxes with the fourth, fourth horseman. That fourth horseman is the worst. All the other things converge synergistically. But remember, this earthquake that happens with the sixth seal is the earthquake of the resurrection, the parousia. In Romans chapter 8, we read the following. In verses 22 and 23. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of the body. Notice it speaks of the earth itself having birth pangs. 
this is like the earth getting ready to give birth. The resurrection. When Jesus died, there's a resurrection. Between the sixth and seventh seals in Revelation 6, there's this earthquake resurrection. Increased earthquakes parallel increased birth pangs. They're both figures of what's coming. Birth pangs point to the rescue of the man-child, the earthquake, to the resurrection of those who died in Christ. We see this continually. The wars we see, don't look at the scripture from the perspective of the wars. Look at the wars, particularly those of the Middle East, from the perspective of scripture. Revelation 12. These wars, these armed conflicts, are a reflection of what you see happening in the heavenlies. And it will be in various places, the South China Sea, North Korea, it doesn't matter, but especially, ultimately, the Middle East and Revelation 16 and Zechariah 12. Famine! Yeah, but that famine is a reflection of a famine for the hearing of the word of God. The true gospel is not preached as prolifically as it once was. There are many false gospels now. False doctrine abounds. False teachers abound. Pestilence. Corona is there, yes. These locusts in Africa and Central Asia are there, yes. But they're simply a reflection of the unleashing of this demonic avalanche of locusts in a spiritual sense that are coming in Revelation chapter 9 that obviously parallel what happened with Nebuchadnezzar's invasions of Israel in the book of Joel, the four swarms of locusts, or the four invasions. Earthquakes! Increased earthquakes, increased seismic activity point to the coming resurrection. All of these events you see happening and transpiring physically, yes, they are of prophetic importance, but understand why. Our wars are a reflection of the wars in the heavenlies. The famines are a reflection of the famine of the hearing of the word of God. The pestilence are a reflection of the demonic invasion. The earthquakes are a reflection of the impending resurrection of those who died in Christ. That is fell asleep. That is what is happening. There's too much on the internet, too much available in the public domain that is not treating these issues of prophetic importance in the way they need to be addressed. Too many Christians are using conscientization. They are looking at the events themselves and then going to Scripture instead of beginning with Scripture and looking at the events. I hope by the grace of God, this helps you to understand what's happening and points us to what we need to do to prepare the way for the return of Jesus. Thank you so very much for listening and God bless you. My name is James Jacob Prash, Morial Ministries. Adonai to our friends in Israel.